also mentally cocky, and hence a baron of new beginnings. At the root of his cockiness is the con conviction that life and the universe conform to a simple formula, his formula. He is thus without fruitful intervals of groping when the mind is at a when the mind is, as it were, in solution, ready for all manner of new reactions, new combinations, and new beginnings. 119. When an active mass movement displays originality, it is usually an originality of application and of scale. The principles, methods, techniques, etc., which a mass movement applies and exploits are usually the product of a creativeness which was, or still is active, outside the sphere of the movement. All active mass movements have that unbashed imitativeness which we have come to associate with the Japanese. Even in the field of propaganda, the Nazis and the Communists imitate more than they originate. They sell their brand of holy cause the way the capitalist advertiser sells his brand of soap or cigarettes. Much that strikes us as new in the methods of the Nazis and Communists stems from the fact that they are running or trying to run vast territorial empires the way a Ford or DuPont runs his industrial empire. It is perhaps true that the success of the communist experiment will always depend on the unfettered creativeness proceeding in the outside non-communist world. The brazen men in the Kremlin think it magnanimous concession when they say that communism and capitalism can continue for long, side by side. Actually, if there were no free societies outside the communist orbit, they might have found it necessary to establish them by ukase. Some factors which determine the length of the active phase, 120. A mass movement with a concrete limited objective is likely to have a shorter active phase than a movement with a nebulous, in, in, indefinite objective. The vague objective is perhaps indispensable for the development of chronic extremism, said Oliver Cromwell. A man never goes so far as when he does not know whither he is going. When a mass movement is set in motion to free a nation from tyranny, either domestic or foreign, or to resist an aggressor, or to renovate a backward society, there is a natural point of termination once the struggle with the enemy is over, or the process of reorganization is nearing completion. On the other hand, when the objective is an ideal society, or perfect unity and selflessness, whether it be the city of God, a communist heaven on earth, or Hitler's warrior state, the active phase is without an automatic end where unity and self-sacrifice are indispensable for the normal functioning of a society, every day's life is likely to be either religified, common tasks turned into holy causes, or militarized. In either case, the pattern developed by the active phase is likely to be fixed and perpetuated. Jacob Bruckenrat and Ernest Renan were among the very few in the hopeful second half of the 19th century who sensed the ominous implications lurking in the coming millennium. Birkhardt, however you pronounce it, B-U-R-C-K-H-A-R-D-T, saw the militarized society, ever premonition which sounds like utter folly, and yet which positively will not leave me. The military state must become one great factory, or must logically come as a definite and supervised stint of misery, with premonitions and in uniform daily begun and ended the sound of drums. Nan's insight went deeper. He felt that socialism was the coming religion of the occident, and that being a secular religion, it would lead to a religification of politics and economics. He also feared a, feared a revival of Catholicism as a reaction against the new religion. Quote, Let us tremble at this very moment penance. The religion of the future is in the making, and we have no part in it. Credulity has deep roots. Socialism may bring back by the complicity of Catholicism a new Middle Age with barbarians, churches, eclipses of liberty and individuality, and a word of civilization, end quote. 121. There is perhaps some hope to be derived from the fact that in most instances where an attempt to realize an ideal society gave birth to the ugliness and violence of a prolonged active mass movement, the experiment was made on a vast scale with which heterogeneous population. Such was the case in the rise of Christianity and Islam, and in the French, Russian, and Nazi revolutions. The promising communal settlements in the small state of Israel and the successful programs of socialization in the small Scandinavian states indicate perhaps that when the attempt to realize an ideal society is undertaken by a small nation with a more or less homogeneous population, it can proceed and succeed in an atmosphere which is neither hectic or nor coercive. The horror a small nation has of wasting its precious human material is urgent need for eternal harmony and coercion as a safeguard against aggression from without and finally the feeling of its people that they are all of one family make it possible to foster a readiness for utmost cooperation without recourse to either religification or militarization. It would probably be fortunate for the Occident if the working out of all extreme social experiments were left wholly to small states with homogeneous civilized populations. 
The principles of a pilot plant practiced in the large mass production industries could thus perhaps be employed in the realization of social progress. That the small nations should give the Occident the blueprint of a hopeful future would in itself be part of a long established pattern. For the small states of the Middle East, Greece and Italy have given us our religion and the essential elements of our culture and civilization. There is one other connection between the quality of the masses and the nature of the duration of an active mass movement. The fact that the Japanese, Russians and Germans who allow the internal continuation of an active mass movement without a show of opposition were endured to submiss submissiveness or iron discipline for generations before the rise of their respective modern mass movements. London was aware of the enormous advantage the submissiveness of the Russian masses gave him. How can you compare, he explained, the masses of Western Europe with our people, so patient, so accustomed to privation? Whoever reads that Madame de Stael said of the Germans over a century ago cannot but realize what ideal material they are for internal mass movements. The Germans, she said, are vigorously submissive. They employ philosophical reasoning to explain what is the least philosophic thing in the world, respect for force and fear which transforms that respect into admiration. One cannot maintain with certitude that it would be impossible for a Hitler or a Stalin to rise in a country with an established tradition of freedom. What can be asserted with some plausibility is that a traditionally free country, a Hitler or a Stalin, might not find it too difficult to gain power, but extremely hard to maintain himself indefinitely. Any marked improvement in economic conditions would almost certainly activate the tradition of freedom, which is a tradition of revolt. In Russia, as pointed out in the Section 45, the individual who pitted himself against Stalin had nothing to identify himself with, and his capacity to resist coercion was nil. But in a traditionally free country, the individual who pits himself against coercion does not feel an isolated human atom, but one of a mighty race, his rebellious ancestors. 122. The personality of, leader, of the leader is probably a crucial factor in determining the nature and duration of a mass movement. Such rare leaders as Lincoln and Gandhi not only try to curb the evil inert in the mass movement, but are willing to put an end to the movement when its objective is more or less realized. They are of the very few in whom power has developed the grandeur and generosity of the soul. Stalin's medieval mind and his tribal ruthlessness were chief factors in the prolonged dynamism of the communist movement. It is futile to speculate on what the Russian Revolution might have been like had done and lived a decade or two longer. One has the impression that he was without that barbarism of the soul so evident in Hitler and Stalin, which, as Hercules said, make our eyes and ears evil witness to the doings of men. Stalin molded his impossible successors in his own image, and the Russian people can probably expect more of the same for the next several decades, obviously written before the fall of the Soviet Union. Cromwell's death brought the end of the Purton, Purton Revolution, while the death of the Robert's fear marked the end of the active phase of the French Revolution. Had Hitler died in the middle of the 1930s, Nazism would probably have shown under the leadership of a Goring a fundamental change in its course, and the Second World War might have been averted. Yet the sphere of Hitler, the founder of the Nazi religion, might perhaps even have been greater evil than all the atrocities, bloodshed, and destruction of Hitler's war. 123. The manner in which a mass movement starts out can also have some effect on the duration and mode of termination of the active phase of the movement. When we see the Reformation, the Puritan, American, and French revolutions, and many of the nationalist uprisings terminate after a relatively short active phase in a social order marked by increased individual liberty, we are witnessing the realization of moves and examples which characterize earliest days of these movements. All of them started out by defying and overthrowing a long-established authority. The more clear-cut this initial act of defiance and the more vivid its memory in the minds of the people, the more likely it is the eventual emergence of an individual liberty. There was no such clear-cut act of defiance in the rise of Christianity. It did not start by overthrowing a king, a hierarchy, a state, or a church. Martyrs there were, but not individuals shaking their fists under the nose of proud authority and defying in the view of the whole world. Hence perhaps the fact that the authoritarian under order ushered in by Christianity endured almost unchallenged for 1500 years. The eventual emancipation of the Christians mind at the time of the Renaissance in Italy drew its inspiration not from the history of early Christianity, but from the stirring examples of individual independence and defiance as the Greco-Roman past. There is a similar lack of dramatic act of defiance at the birth of Islam and of the Japanese collective body, and in neither are there even now signs of genuine individual emancipation. German nationalism, too, unlike the nationalism of most Western countries, did not start with a spectacular act of defiance against established authority. It was taken under the wing from its beginning by the Persian army. The seed of individual liberty in Germany is in its Protestarianism and not its nationalism. 
The Reformation, the American, French, and Russian revolutions, and most of the nationalist movements opened with grandiose overture of individual defiance, and the memory of it is kept green. By this test, the eventual emergence of individual liberty in Russia is perhaps not entirely hopeless. Hmm. Useful Mass Movements 124 In the eyes of the true believer, people who have no holy cause are without backbone and character, a pushover for men of faith. On the other hand, the true believers of various hues, through they view each other with mortal hatred and are ready to fly at each other's throats, recognize and respect each other's strength. Hitler looked on the Bolsheviks as his equals and gave orders that former communists should be admitted to the Nazi party at once. Stalin, in his turn, saw in the Nazis and the Japanese the only nations worthy of respect. Even the religious fanatic and the militant atheist are not without respect for each other. Dostoevsky put the following words in Bishop Tehum's mouth. Outright atheism is more to be respected than worldly indifference. The complete atheist stands on the pendulum step to most perfect faith. But the indifferent person has no faith whatever except a bad fear. All the true believers of our time, whether communist, Nazi, fascist, Japanese, or Catholic, we claim volubly, and the communists still do, in the decadence of the Western democracies. The burden of their talk is that in the democracies people are too soft, too pleasure-loving, and too selfish to die for a nation, a god, or a holy cause. This lack of readiness to die, we are told, is indicative of an inner rot, a moral and biological decay. The democracies are old, corrupt, and decadent. They are no match for the vile congregations of the faithful who are about to inherit the earth. There is a grain of sense, and more than a grain of nonsense, in these declamations. The readiness for united action and self-sacrifice is, as indicated in section 43, a mass movement's phenomenon. In normal times, a democratic nation is an institutionalized association of more or less free individuals. When its existence is threatened and it has to unify its people and generate in them a spirit of utmost self-sacrifice, the democratic nation must transform itself into something akin to a militant church or a revolutionary party. This process of religification through often difficult and slow does not involve deep reaching changes. The true believers themselves imply that the decadence they declaim about so valuably is not an organic decay. According to the Nazis, Germany was decadent in the 1920s and wholly viral in the 1930s. Surely a decade is too short a time to work significant biological or even cultural changes in a population of millions. It is nevertheless true that in times like the Hitler decade, the ability to produce a mass movement in short order is of vital importance to a nation. The mastery of the art of religification is an essential requirement in the leader of a democratic nation, even through the need to practice it might not arise. And it is perhaps true that extreme intellectual fastidiousness or a businessman's practical mindedness disqualifies a man for national leadership. There are also perhaps certain qualities in the normal life of a democratic nation which can facilitate the process of religification in time of crisis and are therefore the elements of a potential national vitality. The measure of a nation's potential vitality, vitality is as a reservoir of its longing. The saying of Herculitus, spelled H-E-R-A-C-L-I-T-U-S, that, quote, it would not be better for mankind if they were given their desires, end quote, is true of nations as well as individuals. When a nation ceases to want things fervently or directs its desires towards an ideal that is concrete and limited, its potential vitality is impaired. Only a goal which lends itself to continued perfection can keep a nation potentially virile, even through its desires are continually fulfilled. The goal need not be sublime. The gross ideal of an ever-rising standard of living has kept this nation fairly virile. England's ideal of the country gentleman, and France's ideal of the retired re retainer, and concrete and limited. This definiteness, definitiveness of their national ideal has perhaps something to do with the lessened drive of the two nations. In America, Russia, and Germany, the ideal is indefinite and unlimited. 125. As indicated in Section 1, mass movements are often a factor in awakening and renovation of stagnant societies. Through it cannot be maintained that mass movements are the only effective instrument of renaissance, it seems yet to be true that large generous social bodies such as Russia, India, China, the Arabic world, and even Spain, the process of awakening and renovation depends on the presence of some widespread fervent enthusiasm which perhaps only a mass movement can generate and maintain. When the process of renovation has to be realized in short order, mass movements may be indispensable, even in small homogeneous societies. The inability to produce a full-fledged mass movement can be, therefore, a great handicap to a social body. It has probably been one of China's great misfortunes during the past hundred years that its mass movements, the Taiping Rebellion and Sun Yat-sen's revolution, deteriorated or were stifled too soon. 
China was unable to produce a Stalin, a Gandhi, or even an Achuk who could keep a genuine mass movement going long enough for a drastic reforms to take root, or take 